If you would please turn to John chapter 17. We'll look at verses 2 and 3. This, of course, is in that Gethsemane prayer of our Lord. And it is rich in many good things that help us to be better in our faithful service to Jesus. Today, I would like for us to zero in on this is eternal life. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Now watch specifically verses 2 and 3. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Notice that our Lord is speaking of everlasting or eternal life. Verse 2, he speaks of eternal life when he says that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And then in verse 3, and he says, this is eternal life. To say the best of it, it is a major theme in the gospel of Christ. Jesus was crucified so he could offer eternal life to all men. In Christ's earthly ministry in the third chapter of John, verses 14 through 16, Scripture says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We learn that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4 and Romans 3, 23. We also know the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23, but it doesn't stop there in that verse. It also tells us that eternal life is the gift from God. But that raises the question, what exactly is eternal life? Now we sang some songs a moment ago, and most of them we sing along that line are like that because it focuses in on the next life. After this world is long gone, the judgment's taken place, we've been resurrected, we've been welcomed into heaven, and we focus on the glories and majesties the Bible gives us of that eternal home of the soul. But Jesus was crucified so he could offer eternal life. The scripture says that, and we can't deny it. Who would want to? John 3, 14 and 16, and Romans 6, 23. But I want you to think of it, and there's some error, of course, as there is on any topic in the Bible, there'll be error on it. There's some error saying, well, we, we have eternal life already. Now, we've got to think about that for a minute because of what the Scriptures say. Is it a future blessing only after death? Or is it a present possession? Something, in other words, that we as faithful Christians may enjoy now. And if so, how is it? Well, of course, the answer is going to be found in God's Word, the Bible. And in our study, we'll search the Scriptures then to get the answer to these questions. The first, I don't think there's any doubt about it in view of the plainness of the Bible on it, and those who accept the Bible as the revelation of God's will on any matter. 
but it's eternal life yet in our future in heaven many scriptures refer to eternal life as a future blessing Jesus spoke of it in this way in Matthew 25 46 and he echoed these sentiments in Mark 10 28 through 30 Here's what he said Matthew, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment. We had something to say about that last week. But then he spoke of the others, but the righteous into life eternal. Certainly that establishes that the fullness of eternal life is out there yet in our future. Paul, inspired of the Spirit, wrote it in this way, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, Titus 1-2. Other places in the scriptures, Titus 3-7, and in the book of Romans, Romans 6-22, speaks of that eternal life. So many think of eternal life only. I use the word only there deliberately. Only in this way, as a future blessing. And truly it is. An everlasting existence in the presence of God free from death, temptation, struggles, sorrow, pain, all the troubles there are in this life, such as mentioned even in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. But when we use the word eternal life, I think I said this too last week, we're speaking of not just mere duration, are we? Because they have endless duration in hell. But we're talking about the quality of life that's in heaven. Now I don't think with all the Bible has to say about heaven. That we can ever get our mind around it. As to the glory and majesty of it. And what we have in this life as is said in these scriptures. Is the expectation with a strong desire to receive the promise. The expectation of eternal life. So it's certainly scriptural to conceive of eternal life as hope for the future. As I've said many times, we, it allows us to look beyond the veil of tears that is this life and the struggles that are herein and see the eternal reward in heaven that is for all those who love him and keep his commandments. But the part we want to focus in on, I don't think we give as much thought to it. And that is as a present possession. And in what sense could it be eternal life, a present possession? Notice I say in what sense. Well, John often writes of eternal life, the Apostle John. And he writes of it as a present possession. As that which is abiding in one or not faithful to God, it's not. Listen to him in 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath Eternal life abiding in him. Now listen to this also. And this is the record, John writes in 1 John 5, 11 through 13. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. That ye may know that ye have eternal life. And that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Again, that's 1 John 5, 11 through 13. Well, everything we've seen up to this particular point in the study, even in the songs we just sang, pointed to the future home of the soul. The glories and majesties of heaven, 
resurrected, glorified body, away completely from the devil and temptations and the probationary state in the flesh on this earth. That's all over and done with. And that's right. That's true. That's wholesome. That's good. We ought to think of the home of the soul from the standpoint of it causing us to draw more closely to God now. But notice, I think we're seeing another explanation of fuller, and let me underscore that word, a fuller, a more in-depth understanding of the Christian's possession of eternal life. John, by the Holy Spirit, writing part of the New Testament, chose the phrase eternal life in a special sense. I've already referred you to this as far as heaven. Eternal life would be the quality of life that the saved in heaven have. But he's describing a quality of life, and of course it's not just duration, which comes by knowing God and His Son Jesus, and that begins here. So I'm not saying that you already are resurrected, glorified body, and all that. I'm talking about what we believe and the truth that we embody and that we practice. In the manner in which Jesus uses it in John 17, 3, He just plainly says, this is eternal life. Defining it as they that may know God, you, the only true God in Jesus Christ. Well, by the scriptures, do you know God? Paul would say to the Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The quality of life that will be brought to fruition and completeness at the end of time, when we're resurrected in a body like Christ and welcomed into heaven, it doesn't begin right then. It begins when you believe and obey the truth as far as the quality, and that's where I'm focusing, as far as the quality of life that you live now. After all, the whole New Testament is saying, as a Christian, you live on a different level. You think differently. And Paul would even say, let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ. So it begins to dawn on us that as you faithfully, and all that the Bible means by that, serve Christ as a child of God in his family, a Christian in his church, you're already at a level and in a relationship that's different from anybody else in the world. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus. There are blessings faithful children of God have that nobody outside of Christ has. So in this sense, eternal life is a present possession. If you don't have what I just described now, you're not going to have... The the fullness of eternal life when you enter into glory. In fact, I doubt you'll be thinking that much about heaven and the resurrected body and the quality of life that's in heaven with God if you're not really striving to bring your mind in subjection to Jesus Christ here and live as He teaches us to live. When we come to know God, and Jesus, we are beginning to develop a quality of life that surpasses what the world has to offer. We probably don't emphasize that nearly enough as far as what a Christian really is and what it means to change states when we leave the lost state of an alien sinner. We're converted and we're baptized into Christ a different state a different relationship and in that sense is the way I say now that we have a present possession uh, it's the quality of life that the faithful child of God lives it's a foretaste of the flawlessness of that life that will be and can only be once this world is over and done with and heaven is a reality to us all. We would do well to understand then that why we say sometimes 
when you're together with faithful children of God at a time like this, you're much closer to heaven than you would be otherwise. Why? Because of the, we talk about this a lot of times, parents and their children, because of the quality time and the quality people that you have. Now, does that tell us why so much is said about don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is? Certainly it does. This is part of the fellowship that those who have this unique life that nobody else does, the faithful child of God, that's why we should cherish sometimes of this. And we get from this kind of thing what you can't get from any other place or from any other people. How's the song go? A foretaste of heaven. A foretaste of life. Well, if you don't get a foretaste of heaven by the quality of life that the New Testament joins upon members of the church to be faithful to God, where are you going to get it? You won't get it on television. You won't get it at the movies. You won't get it over the computer, the internet. You won't get it at work. You won't get it in the schools. You won't get it in government. It's going to come through this concerted efforts of members of the church and all the Bible describes that to mean, putting into practice the truth of God and their attitude one toward another and that collective attitude together toward God. So is not our life with God in that sense now? Thus it's the beginning of what will go on to its fullest in the resurrection and in heaven. What makes us better here can only, it's not, let's put it this way, it's not going to change in the sense of all these things stop. Everything joined upon us, the way we're supposed to think and act and the dispositions of the heart, that doesn't stop when we die. We've been putting it into practice here because it's the mind of Christ that controls us as it's expressed in the words of Christ as to what we think about, what we do and don't do and how we, whatever. Well, that doesn't stop at death, does it? It's just brought out in its fullness more and more. So Jesus actually spoke of, of life, eternal life, in both ways. In the ultimate way we think of it, the future blessing, and the way we think of it, and I'm not saying we don't need to do that. We do. I'm just trying to say, add the other to it. Because he spoke of it in that way too as a present possession from the standpoint of the quality of life the New Testament enjoins upon us in shaping our character for what heaven has to offer. And if the New Testament's not going to shape our character in the likeness of Christ, what is? And aren't we taught in various ways in the New Testament that we're to be in the likeness of Christ in the way we do? How, what sense does it make for Paul to write what he did to the Philippians if that's not the case. In Philippians chapter 4, now we've used this many times, right? No, we've used it from the standpoint of thinking of the quality of life we have here coming to full consummation in heaven, but it starts here. Listen to what Paul says we're to be doing in the church as faithful Christians. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, is that going to end when we die or when heaven starts and we're there in a glorified body at the end of the world? Whatsoever things are honest, honesty going to disappear? Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, what are we to do with those things? If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, Forget these things. <laughs> That's not the way it reads. It tells us to think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard. Look what Paul's saying you've seen in me. And seen in me 
do. What's the result? And the God of peace shall be with you. Some people are looking for the God of peace to be with them, but they're not putting these things into practice. Thus, their character is not made in the image of God. Christ in you, as Paul said to the Colossians, the hope of glory. How is Christ in you and how is Christ in me if his will does not reside in us? And we're always seeking to bring every thought and subjection to Jesus Christ. What's that saying? It's saying we're seeking that quality of life. They won't end here. But we brought to full bloom the glorified body and the eternal realms of glory in heaven. Yes, there's a sense in which we look toward heaven as possessing it, literally being there. But who has a right to do that but the person who's following what Paul said here? So I think we miss some things sometimes as to the comfort and strength God intends for us to have by thinking that, well, all there is to heaven is out there. No, it begins here. It begins right here. By our embodying the truth of God's Word concerning the living Christian life. And I've got to be born anew for that to happen. I've got to be born of the water and the Spirit. There's got to be a transition. There's got to be a conversion. There's got to be a change of states where I was out there in the world, alien sitter cut off from God, not having all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. To where now I've been converted. Now I've changed states. I was baptized into Christ. The old man of sin's dead. Now I'm a new creature in Christ. A new creature in Christ. Where does that start? When I reach heaven? Or does it start now? It starts now when I rise in that watery grave of baptism. And look how Peter puts it. As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may what? Stay static. <laughs> that you may grow thereby. Grow in what? In understanding better what it is to have the heavenly quality of life that will be brought to fruition. When we stand before the King of kings and Lord of lords and a body like His and see the smiling face of the Savior we've served, say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the glories of thy Lord. But where did it begin? Where did we start shaping that character? Where did we respond to Christ? Where did we decide to live on a level different from the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes of pride of life? Where do we show God that we really want to be in His presence? Right here. By heeding the gospel call and by obeying from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to us, being then made free from sin, John 17 and 18. We became what? Where do you become a servant of righteousness? Here. And what does it mean? Well, all of God's commandments are righteousness. If I want the quality of life that Christ offers It'll be by complying with the qualities that are set out in the commandments of God. So is it any wonder that the Old Testament writer would say, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. And in so doing, our characters are molded in the likes of Christ. You remember one time, and we'll close the lesson with this, you remember one time, it was when the Lord was in Samaria, when he was dealing with the Samaritan woman. His disciples had gone away into the city to buy something to eat. I know they're, you know, they're going to be members of the church because they're looking for something to eat. And Jesus stays there and sits on the side of the well, and that's when he does the great teaching with the woman from Samaria on the everlasting water. And if you drink this, you'll never thirst again. <laughs> So they came back, and they couldn't figure out what the deal was, as they did with, in many cases with the Lord. But he made the statement to them when they said something about eating, and this is characteristic of the faithful child of God all his life. I have meat that you know not of. In other words, all sustenance is not meant for the physical. And he's saying, I have what you don't understand. I have the spiritual sustenance. 
What did he say in Matthew 5, the Beatitudes? Who would be filled? Those that hungered and thirsted after righteousness. They shall be filled. Who are those people? They're the people that will receive the meekness and grafted word, which is able to save their souls in obedience to the gospel. And they'll live righteous lives in the church of the living God, forming in them the characteristics of their Savior and head of the church, Jesus Christ. If you're not a child of God, the Bible tells us how to do that in believing in Christ, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in Him, and being buried with our Lord in baptism. And you're what? You're raised to walk in newness of life. As a child of God, then sometimes we get off base and we miss that quality of life God and His Word enjoins upon us here on earth and we let this whole world kind of pull us back that direction. Whatever that may be, we need to repent of it. We pray God for forgiveness as we confess it. If you have a need, as we've discussed here, then we invite you to come while we stand and sing.